What's going on, everyone? Taylor Kyle's here for CLNS Media, coming at you with another episode of Pat's Daily, brought to you by our good friends at FanDuel. More from them later. But for now, I am honored to be welcoming Matt Waldman of the Rookie Scouting Portfolio onto the show. Huge fan of Matt's work. And with the Combine Week finally approaching, it's time to talk some offensive prospects, get a better feel for some of the options that the Patriots might have in this upcoming class Matt, you do such a genuinely tremendous job when it comes to the finer details. Every time you either upload a video onto YouTube or Twitter, I end up learning something about different positions that I have never heard before, like the hip stuff. I know that you would talk about with Roman Wilson. I saw that and I'm like, I watch and it's just something that I don't ever notice. Really value your insight, brother. Thank you so much for coming on. And how in the heck are you during this busy time? I'm doing great. I know I look like a hermit right now, and that's generally what it is. My wife just usually laughs and says, I'm just going to pretend you don't exist for the next few months, <laughs> um, you know, until April 1st is over and when the, the, the RSP comes out. But I'm doing great personally. And, and you know, so it's, it's a pleasure to be on with you and for us to get a chance to chop it up. Absolutely, brother. All right. So with the Patriots, you know, I Mike Reese actually had a really good piece this weekend kind of talking about. Ron Wolf, the father of uh, the Patriots de facto general manager, Elliot Wolf, detailing from Andrew Brandt's perspective, who was a former vice president with the Packers during Ron Wolf's time, how the strategy might be changing in the front office, where there's a big emphasis on development, making sure that young players get opportunities to play. You know, we also heard about some best player available type strategies, things like that. And it's clearly a different era right now. And a big reason it is that way is because Bill Belichick and his regime, when it came to the scouting process, the evaluation and player acquisition, kind of fell off in recent years. So I'm curious from your perspective, what exactly was behind that and how do you feel the Belichick regime scouting department kind of failed and ultimately led us to where we are right now? Well, I'm going to make some estimations based on some detective work that I that, that I could Put together here and and i think i need to give a little background at first because even though i do look like a, a hermit or someone lost at sea right now um i would say that the uh well if you saw my beard right now but the uh i like it uh, i appreciate it but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh but i used to be in operations management i used to be in quality management for over a decade and i learned processes on how to um among other things on how to put together processes that were best practices for evaluating performance. And so it's not just about whether, you know, when it comes to knowing football, how well you know football, because I don't think I need to genuflect upon the throne of what Bill Belichick has done. You know, I think we all can do that and, and honor how, what an all time great he was and how great the Patriots have been. Um, that said, you know, his specialty is football, his, and then to some degree coaching, and there's some level of management with that, and there was some level of personnel management. But it's not like he specialized in operations management or quality management, other than maybe doing some quality control work, working his way up as like a young man. So, you know, when it comes to those areas, you learn about things like how do you reduce variation in how you approach a process? Because it's okay to have different ways of coming coming to different, having different ideas or having, um, seeing something differently, but you want it set up, your process for evaluation to be uniform enough that everyone understands what it is you're looking at and how you define it. So I, that's something that I specialized in, and that's what the RSP specializes in, the Rookie Scouting Portfolio, in terms of its processes and how it was laid out. So... You know, I say that because I've had I have customers who are NFL people. I've had Alex Brown, who was the um, you know head the director of recruiting at SMU, worked at Rice, worked at Houston. Talk about you know he meets with these guys weekly, and he knows the two most looked at publications for cross checking purposes that are independent. And the RSP is one of them. So you know, when I talk about this, I. I do want to say that I'm not just some guy who's in in my mom's basement, you know, having conversations about this, you know, um, it's so, you know, when it comes to putting together a process, part of a good process is making sure that everyone's on the same page. And I remember listening to the ringer a couple of years ago when they had um, Kevin Clark had Dante Scarnecki on and it was, you know, it was a, a thing talking about we're going to give insight into how the pa Patriots, you know, what their draft rooms like and how assistant coaches have input into the draft room. 
And it's meant to be a positive thing and kind of look into looking behind the curtain of this organization. And I think for most people, it was a very positive thing. And there were certainly positive things about it. But as someone with my my expertise and past and and present with building things that you want to continue to develop, I saw some really glaring issues with that. And one of it was that they talked to Dante Scarnecchia talked about, said, well, how it worked for us is that after the playoffs or the Super Bowl, wherever we were, we would get a punch list of players to look at. And Bill would want us to look at these players. And then we'd give our feedback. And we usually give our feedback to the to the Bill and to the front office and the scouts and a report about what we saw and why this was important or that was important that they missed. And it sounds like some sort of quality control thing. But you really want to have everybody on the same page with how you're going to evaluate each position before you evaluate it. You would want you want, want kind of clear guidelines about, because if they're saying, this is what we want to look at at tackle, this is what we want to look at at wide receiver, these are the things that are valuable to us. Well, you want that embedded into your scouting process before you ever start watching the film. And so you might want to start at the beginning of the year reaffirming these things or changing things up and making sure everyone's on the same page throughout rather than waiting at the 11th hour to do this. And that's part of the problem because what that leads to unintentionally is that the coaching staff is the final say that overrides the year or years of work that the scouts are doing. And I'm not saying that there, I have some sort of interview where the scouts say that this is happening, um, but it's just natural to know that this is what the outcome will be if you have someone coming in at the 11th hour to say, let's, let's override these things. And then the scouts aren't sure from one year to the next where what should this should be and where everybody's on the same page with. So if you say we need receivers who can have this type of releases or read coverage in this fashion or don't have any technical issues with their hands, you know, or we need or we value guys who are better with reading zone coverage than guys who are man to man, then you won't waste the scouts time spending a lot of time on different areas that they don't need to. We're prioritizing things in a way that doesn't work. And then you have too much of this. And then what happens sometimes is that you can create this fracture where the GM, in this case, it didn't matter, but like, you, you know, your head of personnel and your GM or your personnel scout, head of scouting and your, and your head coach are at loggerheads about a player. You know, for instance, last year, a good example of that I had written in last year's RSP about Sam Laporta. And I had him, I think, as my number two or number three ranked, my number three ranked tight end and said, you know, listen, he's not for every team because of the way he's built and what type of skills he has and what types of skills that he's not particularly strong at. But the the biggest issue, potential issue for his career is that the, the scouts love him or hate him and the GM loves him or hate him in the opposite direction or the coach does. And then the GM and coach aren't on the same page. The GM drafts this player thinking he's great for what we would like to go to. But the coach is like, I don't want to go there. So now I'm going to fatten up Sam Laporta or at least bulk him up. And he's going to not become the explosive route runner he's capable of being. Not the runner after the catch he is. And now he's stuck on special teams because he's never going to see the field because they bulked him up by 15 pounds that he can't carry. And he can't still can't block as well because he's not as explosive and he's still short by comparison or whatever. And I remember doing that, writing that, and the scout was like, you have a scout that I have that works, um, that is a subscriber of mine that does talk to me regularly, said, you have no idea how often this happens. Like, he's like, this is such a common occurrence. And so when you create this variation and you're not, and you're creating a situation where somebody else is riding over the top like that, it can, it can be a, a continually frustrating thing because the main people doing the legwork never completely know what it is you want. And, and don't, and now they're starting from ground zero every year, as opposed to really truly getting better every year. And if you're afraid you're going to get cursed out by Bill Belichick or dealt with in a fashion where you feel like you're gone, especially in the scouting industry where guys generally are just 
30 or slightly under trying to start their career having a really um, hard time to get a job. And if they lose the job, then they're in a situation where um, it's very hard to get a new one. So that's kind of the dynamics with it. So probably when you look at the repeat mistakes that happen and then you look at the combined um, issue that you, you just or that you would see with how Skarnarkia characterized how the, the, the position coaches are used, you start to realize that there were opportunities to improve that process. And, there, and the Patriots aren't the only one, that's for sure. And then to kind of build on that, because the disconnect does seem like that was ultimately what collapsed. And the message from Gerard Mayo has consistently been they want to be more collaborative, where even last season he would have scouts come into his room so that he could better understand on both sides kind of how their processes work. So if the Patriots do embrace this more collaborative approach, collaborative approach where people are on the same page you get to hear from different voices in your experience how do you avoid not having you know too many cooks in the kitchen and having kind of an overlap of opinion that's just not productive versus being in a situation where you really do have people kind of functioning on the same page and being more of that well-oiled machine yeah i think i think for starters is it would you know i'm going to tell you ideal situations and maybe you'll see what happens as a result of that but the ravens are a really good example of a team that kind of and the steelers who generally have a type of player everyone knows the types of players they're looking for at certain positions and they communicate that from the top down throughout the organization so everybody knows what it is they're looking for what to recognize how and then from there, you hope that they refine the details of how to score it. You know, in a perfect world, it would be nice for them to get together and say, all right, let's write down something. Let's put some things in writing that we fundamentally want from each position, what those details are for what we want, and make sure everyone who is going to do some level of evaluation has that. And that we also check in and make sure that we understand what it is that we're looking for. Now, I don't think you're going to see teams go into that level of detail most of the time, but some teams head in that direction. Um, the other thing is that the collaborative approach, meaning that you get your your coaches, scouts, and front office in the same room at, at certain points, maybe throughout the season or um, at points well before the draft, and you give and you have certain um, meetings where everyone has a free opportunity to speak up and talk about what they're saying, what they see, what they have questions about without feeling like there's going to be a reprisal for that in terms of their job or their status and that it's a little more free flowing. The, the Colts were very good at that under Chris Ballard um, for a period of time where they allow some of that and there's some value with doing so. Um, and then I think at the end of the day, you need to have strong ownership, which I think the Patriots do, but have strong ownership who maybe doesn't meddle in what's going on. But when there is coach, GM, or scouts at loggerheads about what's going on, that they're the final voice and that we, we're clear about that. But instead of being one of the things that we see a lot and I hear scouts complain about a lot is that ultimately it's just like corporate America and where you can have all the legwork. And a good example is, you know, way back in the day when it was Matt Leiner, Jay Cutler, and Vince Young. And the Titans, it was very clear, uh, we learned later on, is that in the in the draft room, the scouts and the head coach wanted Jay Cutler. The They felt like they could work with him. He fit what their offense was going to be about, and he could develop. Norm Chow, the, the former offensive coordinator for USC, who was just hired by the Titans at that time, wanted Matt Leiner, his guy. And the owner... At the end of the day, the owner decided because Houston said hit the road, he basically wanted to flip the bird at the, the population of Texas and take their son, um, Vince Young, who didn't fit what they wanted to do. And this was something that was, you know, very clear that happened. And you could even look back at some of the, the, the shows and see that they were talking pre-draft about where teams were at. But Bud Adams, you know, later on, we learned years later that it was Bud Adams was the one. And you see that a lot of owners, sometimes they ignore all the work that they're paying salaried staff to do. And they listen to a three or four letter word network or initial network 
and and a talk show that's that's designed to entertain um, more than inform. And they hear maybe someone who has a lot of money in advertising for their that pays a lot of money in sponsorships or or is a big name person in their city. And you know, I'm gonna over maybe characterize this in a dramatic way, but maybe they're in the steam room talking and the guy's talking smack about what Skip Bayless said or Stephen that you know, A. Smith or whoever, you know, and they don't and they're talking smack about it, and the owner's like, you know what? This guy, this this Zach Wilson's going to be the answer. You know, we need to get this Zach Wilson. You know, even though maybe the staff was like, "Yeah, well, there's some other players we really like here," and that's the thing that nobody likes to talk about. But unfortunately, there are even scouts complain that there are owners who play fantasy football. So the Roonies are not one of them, um, and I don't think the Cra- I don't think Mr. Kraft is either. But there are there are some that are, and more than you think. You know, if the crafts are like subscribing, liking, and viewing, like that's cool, appreciate it. But I hope they're not taking any draft advice from me or anybody else on this station. This is for fun. We're doing our best, but we are not getting paid to do that kind of evaluation. Yeah. And I know the crafts; they kind of you know they get some flack for you know alleged meddling. Like we've seen the past couple of years, they did get involved, but. I think it's important to remember that happened once things really started going off the tracks and it became very clear that something had to be done. As we saw, they made the move. I really don't expect that that's going to be an issue anymore, especially with Elliot Wolf and all the respect that he has around the league. You know, yeah. they could always still, they said they could bring in a true general manager because no one has the title yet, but it does seem like he's going to have the opportunity to show what he has this off season. Going to be interesting to see how this whole experiment plays out. All right. Moving from the process to the actual NFL combine. I'm very curious because this is a process where, you know, there's a lot of good things that come out of this. Like the bigger ones are, you know, just from my uh, own perspective is the interview process, because then you get a better idea of who you're actually potentially bringing into your building, how they operate under pressure, these questions, all those kinds of things. Then you get cons like, yeah, but then you have these guys working out for drills rather than what Marvin Harrison Jr. decided to do and opting out of those and saying, hey, I'm going to get ready for football because that's what's going to help me the most. From your perspective, what are the good things that come out of the combine and what are some of the not so great things that come out of this process? Yeah. And I think Marvin Harrison Jr.'s answer was my favorite answer ever is that I'm going to get ready for football because, and we'll get into that in a minute, but the valuable things you're right. You touched on the interviews. It's a time where you learned enough about these guys that you can start to tell who's rehearsed and who's going to be uh, a little bit more forthcoming and candid and genuine. Um, so there's there's that aspect of it. And you're, you've got all the layers of information. So now you're wanting to see how it all kind of fits together in the puzzle. So that's part of it. You, you certainly want to you're going to have some questions for each of these guys that are probably um, well prepared, at least the better teams and then the worst teams. Maybe they're they're not as well prepared or they're trying to do inflammatory things because they feel like somehow that's going to be helpful. We've seen that in the past, Um, but that's okay. Some drills are very helpful. I mean, you can measure bench press. You can certainly measure hand size if that, you know, that has value for whatever you're doing. Certain um, agility drills can certainly give you some idea, not only of like the time itself, but looking at maybe how well they can bend and move in certain fashions where it's not so much about the time, but the fluidity that you may have not seen on tape because maybe they're not asked to do certain things that they'll be asked to do in the NFL. So some of these drills can be good in that fashion. So I, I would say that's the, those are the two things. Now the cons, you you know, the workouts aren't realistic most of the time to what you do on football, like the the whole gauntlet drill. You know, let me know when you know you have to get three, five receptions to earn one, and then when that and catch them in different directions. It's you're taking something that may have some value and exaggerating it to the point of circus. And so there's that, and then there's the vaunted forty time. And this is something that I think you'll enjoy hearing about. And I think that will be eye-opening to many people. I have a podcast partner by the name of Brandon Angelo, who is a performance expert, works with track athletes, football players, all sorts of professional athletes. He was a former track athlete at Purdue as well as a running back. And Brandon and I do a show called Going Deep, 
that we do every other week on my RSP cast. Um, and Brandon, you can find his work on X at um, Angelo underscore FF. And Brandon's great. One of the first shows we did, I said, well, you know, you train a lot of these. You're a performance trainer. You train a lot of these athletes. You know, you you are a track athlete. What's what's your take on how the combine measures these things? And this was last year. Boy, did he blow my mind. So I'm going to share what he said. First of all, let's talk about timing athletes in sprints, because the NFL, at least as far as we as far as it was even last year, they use a Zybeck system. That's the brand. Now, there's three types of systems that are used. Zybeck is a brand for one of these systems. The most accurate is a dual laser time system, meaning that basically they use lasers to, to monitor your start and your stop. Those are the most expensive. Then there's the single laser system, which I think does the same, but isn't quite always as accurate. Then there is what's called a frequency based, which people think of as RFID, the radio frequency ID, where you have the chips and run through that. That's the next best of the of the three. Then there's um, partial electronic timing, and then there's hand timing. You know, as as Brandon would say, hand timing is like your high school track back in the day where. You know, you don't know whether you ran a 10-8 or an 11-5, but you won the race and your mom's happy, you know. <laughs> um, the electronic, partial electronic base is what the Zybeck machine at the combine is, which is it's an automatic start and a hand time finish. Now, that's when you think of the range of products that are out there, the combine is using the third, the fourth best out of five to do this. And you would say, well, why is that? Is it because of expense? Well, it costs a couple grand to do some of the dual laser, according to Brandon, the, the dual um, beam timing. But for like colleges, you know, Mississippi Valley State might not have that in their budget, whereas UGA might have five of them, you, you know. <laughs> so, um, you know, just in case one of them breaks down. But it's not even just that. The, the high-end machines need to be calibrated and need to be there's a lot of bells and whistles to learn how to use them right and accurately and as he described you know how many old-time scouts are really going to want to lug that thing around or if they haven't on staff know how to use it and troubleshoot it and be ready that it's there when they've been hand timing for all these years and feel like they've got that down the problem with hand timing or partial electronic timing is that with the hand timing at the end the standard deviation between for what's accurate is between 0.24 and 0.3 seconds. Yeah, you and this is published I from according to Brandon. And he again, he's an expert in this area. Okay. I'm just sharing what he shared on my podcast. 0.24 right. to 0.3. So if you ran a 4.4540 and go, that's pretty good. At best, the, the standard deviation might mean that's a 4.69. So people go, wait a minute. I thought we're getting faster and we're getting, you know, and all these things. But it's the Wild West because when you really look at it, the you would think ideally that you would want everybody to like have these machines so that we could start from a certain point. But back in the 80s when Bo Jackson supposedly ran a 4.19, you know, is that really real? You know, was it real? You know, the the Olympic athletes when they're timed in their in they're doing the Olympic the Olympics by Swift or these dual beam versions of these products. The NFL isn't doing that. In Indy, at least up till last year and probably this year, it's the Zybeck machine. So with a 0.24 to 0.3 standard deviation, which means that maybe if and so people are afraid. Like, I think they're just afraid to, like, start over because they feel like that if people are going to look at the past and say, you know, and are going to lose money as a result of it. But people lose money now because right. even now, sometimes the machines, people run faster than what the machines say if they're not calibrated well. Um, so the con of this is that the, the dirty secret of the combine that nobody really talks about is that the... 
the timing has a wide variance and it makes people a lot of money and it hurts them. And there's other things that don't shouldn't matter as much, but people make a big deal out of like Brandon talked about Quentin Johnston last year and whatever you want to say about him not being able to catch the football, which, you know, was was certainly something you could see pre-draft. You know, people were like, you know, Brandon, Brandon would say, look, this was a four or five runner all day long if you watch him on tape. But he's going to have a – but if he ran, they were worried. They didn't want him to run. And he was like, that saved him a lot of money because he probably would have been scored at 4-6 and dropped low out of the draft. He said, but the thing is, is that people don't understand that not everyone's three-point stance fast. Some people are two-point stance fast. And that – most of the times, wide receivers run out of a two-point stance because of their long-limbed. So it's the difference between what kind of, you know, whether you're long-limbed or short-limbed, you know, long-legged or short-legged. So some people just are great out of a three-point stance. Some people are, are worse out of it. My wife was a track athlete, and I've talked about this a lot on my show. And she was a slew-footed, slow starter but she was a state champion in the state of North Carolina two times over who ran regularly 11.02, which was Marion Jones's time. And she was five foot three and about 125 pounds. She was built more like a, like an, like a slim anvil than a gazelle, like the Flojos <laughs> out in the world. And they would all laugh at her, but she was a slow starter fashion. Well, in the, it's the same thing. When you look at, she was low to the ground. She was probably, but she was a, you know, there are some people who are probably better in some areas than others that the times don't always show. So it, there's a lot of context that's missing from these events. They're fun. They can give you some layers, but I always would recommend to people that I still use the combine times, but I use it compared to what I've estimated by looking at who separates from defensive backs at, at, on these tracks, who separates in these directions from linebackers or, or, when they're running to the far side of the field versus the near side of the field towards the middle, what, what are the positions of things? I try and look at all these contexts so that when I look at a player and go, oh, he ran a 4-6, but then I see him routinely separating from like top good competition in situations that matter, and I go, all right, he's not a, he's not a field flipper or a breakaway artist who's going to give you 70-yard gains, but he's going to give you plenty of 30 to 40-yard gains during his career relative to what we expect. And so I'm not marking him down for a 46540 today, Anquan Bolden or Arian Foster or anybody like that. So we that's the the thing is it can confuse the issue even more. And the NFL is not going to talk about this because it's a big money event. They got all this media coming. They've got, you know, they've got everybody on display. It's it's wall to wall eyeballs to TV for an entire week. You know, they're, they're making this event, they want to make this event what it is. And kudos to them for doing it, but they could be better by creating, you know, doing a better job of maybe buying the equipment, learning how to calibrate it, learning how to operate it, and maybe encouraging teams to do this, you know, college colleges to have to do the same in order for there to be a better balanced way of looking at it and admitting maybe the fact that, Maybe four three, four two, four one. Maybe those aren't at nearly as common as they. Are. I mean, they're rare now, but nearly as common as they actually look right now. Because maybe that's not really the the real real. But people don't want to talk about that because agents lose money. They don't want to go. My guy ran a four five, but everyone really runs a four five in the adjusted era of what it really is about now, because somehow teams are good. They're afraid how teams are going to react to it. And you'd hope that the good teams use those numbers more as context where it's like, all right, does this kind of help lead to what we already thought from the film study? Is it something where it's like, okay, this is a red flag. How did this happen? We got to go back and see if that confirms what the I said, if we're missing something, but do you think there are still teams that will take those numbers and put more value or stock into them even knowing that there are these discrepancies compared to, you know, on the outside, we see the number. And without having that context as outsiders, we're kind of like, oh, take it more at face value. Again, different processes. Yeah. But does that still happen in the league? 
Uh, from what I'm told, I would say most of the time scouts have a fudge factor and GMs and personnel people have a fudge factor. Like, for instance, with pro days, you know, they made um, Brandon talk about this, too, is that Travis Dye ran in a monsoon at USC. And he's a four. He was a uh, like, I think, a four, four guy all day. But because he had to run in, in the rain, his time was bad. Whereas Ohio State is adamant that all their players get to be timed on their hard surface track in the facility on their pro day, nowhere else. And that's a fast track, you know, so they're going to do the home cooking all day. So everyone, every team kind of knows the policies if they're wise to different schools and go, okay, they're going to be, they're going to be kind of hard about this. And we're just going to have to, we're not going to be able to insist. So we got to fudge this and say, we're going to pad a little bit of number onto this because we know it's a fast track. Whereas here, the conditions are bad. We're going to fudge this a little bit. But there's always the chance that there's a new owner trying to make a, uh, you know, make an impact and they think they know better or they're, they're always known for like have leading with their ego and might just say, well, they ran this and somebody's trying to tell them differently and they're like, I don't want to hear it. You know, so as, are they the majority? I don't think they're the majority, but it but it happens on occasion. And then speaking of those pros and cons, so you mentioned pro days. How many of those kind of carry over where it's like some things that you worry about in the combine do? Or what are even some uh, unique pros and cons that are relative to when these teams have an opportunity to give the players more ideal conditions? Yeah, I mean, I think it's nice to I, – I would want my players in those ideal conditions for sure. Um, not only for my recruiting, but also just as as a player, I'd want to be com- where I'm comfortable, don't have to travel, uh, you know, don't have to be in a new place and kind of know the schedule. And and because athletes are very routine oriented if they work hard and practice. So that that type of thing is helpful. And I think that's probably good for them. Um, at the same time, I think the good about the pro days is that oftentimes scouts will say, hey, can we do a little an extra workout with you here? Can you do some things? We want to run you through some drills that we want to see. So they get to customize some things in addition to the scripted experience that we often relate to, especially with quarterbacks. You know, I don't really understand the scripted experience at all. I mean, like, I understand that maybe if you screw up your scripted experience, that could be a big red flag. But is that really football? I mean, I, I football, football to football is an improvisational performance medium especially quarterbacking and that's what people miss the 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 nfl look used to look at the wonder lick they they're looking at s2 now and some of the other processing tests that are out there trying to approximate processing which is closer to improvisation it's like stand-up comedy or jazz or any kind of acting where you have to kind of make you you have theory you under of of, of your medium you, want, you may have a script to an ex- extent, but there are things that you're reacting to. And the best performances are when you're able to summon all the technique, concepts, and theory that you understand and your physical acting ability or, music, or your musicianship, and you can create something off of what you're experiencing and not necessarily what was scripted. As we know, some of the best movie lines come from improvisation. You know, so it's not like everything is scripted that way. And you have to understand that quarterbacking has so many variables. It's that way. So, you know, to make some everything hyper scripted for a a position that is very much an improvisational thing, all you're going to wind up with is you're going to self-select players who do really well on written tests, really well on whiteboards with memorization really well at learning things fast, but not necessarily executing them fast. Economists probably, people with PhD in in economics, probably learn things very fast. They've had lots of practice doing that. But PhDs in in, in economics also are the type of people understand too that they need all the data to make a decision. So when there's a recession and people are losing jobs and and, you're starting to worry about what's going on, you know, you're not waiting to start looking for another job or having a backup plan or saving your money until the data's in to tell you that you had a recession. Because if you did that, that's six months after you already lost your job, most likely. Right. You, you know, and that's what the economists do. So there's a lot of economists thinking with quarterbacks where it's like 
they should see something come open based on the leverage of a play and the ball should immediately come out just like a comedian responds to something with great timing. You know, it's confidence in addition to accuracy of what you see. Alex Smith was an economist, a quarterback. Like he often took three to four, you know, hitch steps to wait on a throw. And by the time he threw it, it was too late. The, the moment had already passed. Whereas Brett Favre didn't know a nickel, you know, until two years into his starting career. But, you know, he had so much confidence that he made, he was a three-time MVP. And yes, he made a lot of mistakes, but that was part of the confidence too, because he had the confidence to trust himself to know that I can work my way out of this. Even if I do something awful, I'm not going to lose my confidence to do the job. And it's not where you screw up and start off screwing up. It's where you finish. And, you know, and that's the thing that people forget about performances in that way, especially in improvisation. You screw up all the time in, in, in that. It's how well you hide the seams and how well you work your way through it without people being able to notice it as much. So, yeah, with the com with the pro days, again, more questions, more follow up, more opportunities to, like, put things together. But the workout stuff, again, there's things that. If the coaches dictate that, that's great. When the scouts dictate it, that's great. When the players are dictating it, it's just it's a job interview where you you've learned stuff and you're and you're basically rehearsing things. And I I don't find as much value in that personally. Yeah, like you said, when they do all the like scripted throws and this is what we're going to do, even watching it, it's nice. You know, it's it's partially entertainment value where you see it and you're like, oh, yeah, this is cool. But it really is only helpful when they know exactly what they have to do and they don't do yeah. it well. And like you said, red flag kind of right. pops up and the rest is kind of all right. You know, we're kind of going even keel. And I love that you mentioned the part about the improvisation, how you finish, because like you say, Brett Favre, I guess today it's similar to like a Josh Allen, where he's someone who will make those mistakes throughout the game and he can still get away with it because he has that confidence. And it's like, OK, yeah, Josh Allen may throw a pick or two, but if you give him a chance to win the game in the fourth quarter, he's probably going to do it because once he's got it figured out and then has those answers to the test and then you have the meshing of, all right, I know what I'm probably going to get and I can do my own thing. That's when these guys get super dangerous. And I wonder how that's going to come up yeah. when we talk about quarterbacks, yeah. which we will get to as we start getting into the prospects. Before we do, a quick word from our friends over at FanDuel. Be right back. Get your buckets with your first bet at FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers will $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your bet wins. Bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams, quick bets. Live same game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Just visit fanduel.com slash Boston and shoot your shot. Fanduel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. All right, Matt, let's keep it rolling with the quarterbacks. So the Patriots most likely going to be in the market for a young signal caller on day one. Mac Jones, you've seen reports that he might be a trade candidate, probably is going to be on the roster. And Bailey Zappi won way more games than I think anybody could have possibly anticipated in his young career, but also seems like he's more of a spot starter. So when we look at the quarterback position in the past, we've seen Alex Van Pelt talk a lot about escapability, creativity, decision-making, arm talent, like all these things that you want from a quarterback. But above those, he talks about things like leadership and toughness and really those things where it's not just how you play. It's a lot of things that are from the shoulders up. So when it comes to the day one prospects, let's start there. Who are some people in the Patriots range that you think would be good fits, whether they stay put at number three or potentially trade back, try to get more picks and take somebody maybe later in the first half of the draft? Yeah, I mean, certainly, I think the Caleb Williams lottery is they're out on that, most likely. So, <laughs> you know, he would be choice number one, obviously, for everybody at this stage. Um, I think what's going to be fascinating is how teams view Drake May, um, because he's a presumptive number two. Um, and I think that a lot of people are split on Drake May overall. He's becoming a more polarizing player. Um, you certainly like the pocket toughness. You like the ability to um, make really all the throws. Um, it's just the, the issue is pinpoint accuracy. And pinpoint accuracy is not completion percentage. Um, talked a lot, long time about, say, Baker Mayfield coming out, who I had compared to maybe more of a, 
a mid-range to higher-end Jeff Garcia at best, as opposed to the next Brett Favre, Russell Wilson, Drew Brees rolled into one that that people were talking about because of completion percentage, because he's not he wasn't pinpoint as a as a thrower. And there's a lot of inaccurate throws on Drake May's tape, and a lot of it's mechanically oriented, where he rushes throws, or that his footwork process, his lower body, has some has some issues where he's a little rudderless in terms of having a stable back foot in terms of where it should be pointed. Um, in addition to that, you have questions about his processing and decision making overall. He'll identify some things pre-snap, but sometimes he skips over first reads that he should have really made. Um, he oftentimes doesn't read leverage very well. This is a this was what I would call a Desmond Ritter problem that as a most recent early round quarter or early round quarterback, I mean, he was third round, but people were talking about him as higher. And he was someone that I didn't even have as barely draftable. Um, you look at that and you worry about may because it, there's times where it just looks like that. He, he doesn't identify where what's open and what's not open in man coverage and situations that he really should. Um, he can be a beat or two too slow waiting for confirmation for some of these reads like he'll wait for a first read he'll look at a first read and then look at a couple more reads and by the time he comes back that that option isn't there anymore um he does not see blindside pressure very well if you ask me and he drifts in the pocket so when i mention him in those ways you can tell that i'm not seeing drake may as the number two quarterback and if the patriots are on the same page as that and they may not they may love him um they, if they don't see him that way, they will probably they may trade back. They may look at this and say, Bo Nix, Jaden Daniels. Um, if people are really getting high on the JJ McCarthy, you know, buildup that's been going on, maybe those three come into play as mid first, you know, for first round options or late first round options. Um, you know, you look at Nix, and uh, you know, I had somebody that you know, I certainly you know, value their opinion and was a former scout who, who does great work out here. And I'll let him, I'll credit him. I'll let him credit himself on this one. Cause I don't know if he'd want to be credited, but he called him bubble screen bow um, from his days <laughs> at, at Auburn and Oregon. And like he's completion percentage. Yeah. Man. That completion. <laughs> but I liked Bo Nix from what I've seen. I understand why he's rising. Um, there's not as many, clips where you say see him in the middle of the field making the reads that people want to see but the ones i've seen look good um i think there is good decision and leverage reading there um he can be late on some throws but I, but it's more about whether he sees things he should um it's a simpler offense in the sense that he does have a lot of mirrored concepts where his routes in the same you know same type of routes on each side of the field so it's not as difficult but he does a good job of kind of understanding what the defense is doing pre-snap and exhibits things that I don't care how complex the, the offense is because I've seen guys in complex offenses just not do a good job of reading things the defense are doing. So when I see Bo Nix read the defense and say, okay, these two corner, the quarterback and the safety are look confused right now. I'm going to target that receiver. You know, I'm going to target this area or I'm going to, I'm going to go in this direction. That tells me someone who sees past the minutia and has potential to do that. So uh, he can scramble. He can move in the pocket pretty well. He doesn't drift like May does. He finds solutions. I, I'm not going to say he's – there's anybody after Williams that I would say I think is going to start year one and do and have a chance to do really well. I would say they're more – unless they're on a great team. But if they're – most of the players in this tier below Williams are guys that if they're in a good situation, they have something to build on. If they're in a, if they're, if it's up and down, maybe they're more Davis Mills like, you know, in terms of, you know, you see moments, but then you see um, bad things because maybe the supporting talent and cast isn't all that great. And then you have, and then on the bad side, you have the New York Jets and what happened with Zach Wilson. Um, you know, that's the bottom and top range with a lot of these guys. So you've got, you know, you got Nick's Jane Daniels. Look, you love the mobility. He's got a good arm. I think that the Georgia game this year showed that he could make more than one read 
you know, which he has a lot in his offense. There's a lot of one read stuff or, you know, he's only had to make one read or he's only made one read and either threw it away, ran, you know, got sacked, whatever. Now, you know, but I think there's more in the tank for him, but there's enough prove it to me still on his tape where you're like, he didn't, you know, you know, people compare him to Lamar Jackson and Lamar Jackson coming out. Listen, Lamar Jackson was an anchor in the pocket. He was great in the pocket and he made multiple reads all the time in a pro style offense. That was great. And that was the part of his game that just kind of went over the heads of a lot of people. And Jane Daniels has physical characteristics that may remind people of Lamar Jackson. And he certainly has potential to develop into a good football player who can work from the pocket. But I think he abandons the pocket a little too early um, that compared to what Jackson does. And I still need to see more with his reading of the field to be sold that he's that he can get there. I think if I had to, you know, if I had to make the call, I would say I'd take the chance on him, but not as an early first round guy. Um, and then JJ McCarthy, I'm revisiting his decisions right now in terms okay. of what I want to look at because. I don't think he's very good in the red zone. I think he misses up very obvious opportunities that good pro quarterbacks will see and maybe get better at that. Um, but you see a lot of throws where people get really excited that look big time because he's reading leverage and he's making those plays. And some of those are really good. Some of those I wonder are happy accidents more than they are actually strong plays. Um, so I'm going to revisit him before the month is up to, to, to double check that and see where I'm at with him. But he's the guy that I look at and say, if it's, if it's intentional more often than not, then I think he could be probably in the same range as Nick's Daniel and, and Daniels as a, as a mid to late round first round guy, if you're going to take that chance, but you'd want all those guys to sit. And then, um, and if not, then, you know, he's more Zach Wilson 2.0. I'm thinking, I think it was against Ohio State. Because when you talk about like him getting lucky in the red zone, is it the throw where the linebacker turns as? Yes. Okay, because I didn't know if I was crazy or not. I'm like, I know a lot of people are hyping this up. But literally, if the linebacker doesn't turn around, that's a pick. And it's not like he knew. So I'm glad to get that confirmation. I thought I was losing my mind on that yeah. one. Yeah, no. And there are certainly plays like that. And there's some good ones. There's a one at the boundary that he throws. Um behind two defenders essentially as he's throwing on the run that's a really nice play and i get that he's doing that well but there are enough plays i've seen on his tape where i go eh, i'm not so sure he's always doing that as on point conceptually as he should and he's getting away with it so you know a little more a little more watching won't hurt from that standpoint mm -hmm. to find out and is Spencer Rattler somebody that you've watched a decent amount of? Because I feel like he's the kind of guy who could slip into one of these tiers. I feel like he doesn't get a lot of hype because, oh, some of it might just be history that he has and that clip that went viral and people not really giving him a chance since then. But I'm curious if you have gotten a good chance to really study him, do you think he's someone that should be rising up and being talked about more? Or is he really more of that kind of like mid-day two option? For you? I'd say he's more of a mid-day two option, but – potential for growth. I just think that he's much better versus one type of coverage than another. And that's kind of, you know, and I'm trying to remember which is which at this point without looking at my report, but I'm pretty sure what it was is that he was much better against man to actually much better against zone than he was man to man. Like he could read zone pretty well, but then man to man reading the leverage of defenders, that was where he really struggled. So if he can get sure that up, I think he can become closer to a complete quarterback who can at least be a high end reserve, you know, um, Ryan Fitzpatrick with wheels type of player. But I think that that may take some time. And we know that the more time that it takes for these young quarterbacks in our impatient NFL um, environment, the, the more they, the likelier they are to be written off. Um, so, you know, Radler to me is just under that Mason Dixon line of, of like contributor who might become a starter. He's, he's close enough though, that if someone takes a chance on him, I'm not going to be shocked by that. Okay. And 
you're kind of confirming my feeling that staying at number three, even if it does include the risk of maybe missing on like a Jaden Daniels, is probably the best call because when everyone talks about how it's the third overall pick, you're not going to really be that high in the draft. Again, ideally to get that kind of quarterback, I just feel like one, obviously the Patriots have a lot of beats, but also if we're talking about, you know, maybe Elliott Wolf taking that old Packers strategy and going with best player available, I'm not sure you're getting the best player available for anybody outside of maybe Williams or maybe a Drake May at that number three pick. And in thinking about that, I'm curious what your process is when it comes to, okay, these are the traits that I look for just as a baseline for like, yes, I want to take this guy and think he could be a potential starter versus maybe these are some things that he struggles with, but I do think in a good system, he'd be able to overcome. Yeah, there's two things that I look for really in a quarterback that I that I think spans whether it was Tom Brady, Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes, Brett Favre, Brock Purdy, or Anthony Richardson. You know, two guys I liked. You know, in in when I evaluated them to varying degrees, I had Richardson my number one. Brock Purdy I had above had a higher score than than I had for. Desmond Ritter, Zach Wilson, most of the the class two years ago, I had Brock Purdy fairly high. But uh, but that said, the common things are pocket movement. How well do you manage a pocket? I don't care whether you can run like Lamar Jackson or you're a, you're basically a statue on casters like Tom Brady. Okay, um, you have to have really good footwork. Tom Brady was a boxer in college. We know that. He has great footwork. He moves around in tight spaces very well. You've got to be able to do that in the pocket and be able to anticipate where the pressure's coming from, feel it, and know where your po- how your pocket's built to make the move, keep your eyes downfield, and make the throw. So I want that. I want guys who also, again, can process information well because everything that's put in the game plan isn't processing. That's just one component of it. You want... You want to have that, you want to have done all the work, but then you want to be able to forget about all that where it's just like instinctive so that when you see a weird situation, you can combine something you practiced on the field, something you practiced off the field with your trainer with something else that you're with, with the game situation and what your players, your teammates good at and being able to do come up with a solution that you could never have practiced or would have never anticipated to practice, but it comes out being good. And those are, that's what I want from quarterbacks. And the top quarterbacks do that, whether it's Joe Burrow or Mahomes or Allen or Tom Brady did that, you know? So, you know, those are the two biggest things that I would say. And pinpoint accuracy. Can you be pinpoint really? And to me, pinpoint isn't just catching the ball and stride with the design of the route. That's one version of pinpoint. Another is, Where's the defender and what's the defensive scheme look like when you're throwing that? Are you throwing it back shoulder and requiring the receiver to make a jumping, you know, back shoulder catch? Well, if you're placing it where only he can make the catch, even though it's an athletic adjustment, that's pinpoint, you know? So, you know, are you placing it in a way where maybe it's a difficult catch, but he's the only one that's going to get it and it's where it has to be? That's pinpoint. So I want to see more pinpoint than just general it's accurate enough that he should have caught it. You know, that's that, you know, and the more you have those three to four things that I mentioned, the better off you are because the rest of this stuff is more the NFL trying to templatize quarterbacks, you know, one size fits all just roll them off an assembly line. Wonderlick check big time production check two years starting check Bill Parcells with his checklist check, you know, (laughs) That really worked well with Lawrence Taylor, right? You know, mm-hmm. who basically told Bill, just cut me or trade me because I don't fit any template of what you want me to do. And if I screw up, go ahead and do it. But can you let me just be me? You know, and Bill learned that. But with quarterbacks, he's a defensive guy. So, you know, the, the template worked way back then before analytics and then before a lot of other things. But, yeah, you, you, you got to understand there's a lot of varieties to success with quarterbacking. And the, those are the common denominators that I think actually make a difference. And what are some of the big things that you hear about, talked about all the time where you hear it and you're just like, yeah, all right, you guys are hyping this up way too much. Like if he gets to a good quarterback's coach and takes to the coaching, this won't be a problem. It doesn't have to be a whole list, but it's something yeah. kind of like gets under your skin when you hear it. 
arm slot, like being the the arm ball slot. wind up. I watched Brett Favre at forty drop in the in the NFC Championship game, drop a ball basically to his knee to throw it from the line of scrimmage. And I'm thinking, you know, maybe not everybody has the release and arm power of Brett Favre, even at forty whatever he was, but there are a lot of players who drop the ball that low and have a uh, a long elongated release. And when you get into mechanics, certainly it has value, but it can be a little overplayed. And that 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 and I'd say arm strength to the extent that you want a certain amount, just like 40 times, just like speed. There's a certain amount to ride the ride. And everything, anything that and over is more than good. Just because it's really great doesn't mean that that player, the 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 better the better the arm strength, the better the player. No. Or the, the you know, there's lots of fast receivers out there and strong arm quarterbacks who couldn't read the field or throw accurately. So the minimum, and the minimum is a little lower than you would expect, like Brock Purdy, Tom Brady early in his career, Drew Brees early in his career. You know, I just mentioned three Pro Bowl players and one player who probably deserved an MVP in his life, and another one who maybe the one of the we know is one of the greatest of all time, if not the greatest of all time. Like that one, especially because I feel like Patriots fans have just a little like shell shock from the Mac Jones experience. But when it comes to the arm strength, if you're somebody who isn't great at it, then one, obviously the scheme needs to cater to that and not ask you to make throws you can't make. But then with the Mac Jones experience, especially last year, you also have to understand what you can and can't do. And if you can't make these crazy throws across the field when you're rolling out, you know, maybe just don't do that. You don't get some of the comments. And and maybe. Yeah, and maybe you don't get paying pay extra money for a receiver who's a jump ball receiver who basically isn't the the most unbelievable route runner that you would want from a primary esque option, you, you know, or or you get another player who's extremely fast but maybe needs work as as, as a route runner. You need a precision type of wide receiver core, and you didn't have a precision wide receiver core relative to other teams. Devontae and Taekwon catching strays, but hey, that's what it is. All right, now let's move on to the wide receiver position. Since we're already on it, let's go. There's the Marvin Harrison Jr. discussion where, again, we're talking about best player available. At number three, it sounds like Marvin Harrison Jr. would be that guy. I'm curious. Do you think with the Patriots not really having their future set at the quarterback position, that would be a responsible investment? And then do you think there are some up, who, I'm sorry, who are some other options on day two that you think the Patriots could bring in and could do enough that they could be early contributors who also fit in that kind of Cleveland-esque offense where they're going to be blocking a lot in the run game most likely, but they also want that kind of dynamic athlete who can really get yards after the catch. And I know that our returnability was something that uh, the team also mentioned they probably look for. Yeah, so there's a lot of guys in this class, you know, that can certainly fulfill that role. If you're not looking for a straight up primary number one, Stefan Diggs, third and 15, facing Jalen Ramsey at the end of the game, and he knows you're throwing the deep out, you know, and you throw it and he still catches it on Jalen Ramsey in that pivotal (laughs) moment. You know, that's what a number one receiver to me is. That's what Mm -hmm. it's always been is he can run every route, you can line him up in a variety of positions and he's going to make the play against the top guy or you're going to lean on him to do so. And he does it often enough that you're keeping him. Well, Marvin Harrison Jr. Marvin Harrison Jr. would be a nice pick for the Patriots in the sense that you get, I think, not an A.J. Green player, though I think a lot of people feel that way. I see him more as a maybe Mike Williams plus type of player or a T. Higgins plus type of player. Um where people already have inflated expectations with those two guys. Um, But I would say he's where people have the inflated expectations of them as opposed Mm to, you know, that means he's a top starter. I think he's ideally a 1B receiver more than he is a top, top, top guy. That doesn't mean I don't love him. He's an immediate starter. He's an immediate starter. He's fantastic at the highlight plays that people love, which is, you know, winning those contested catches, drop, you know, tracking the ball over his shoulder, being able to work over the middle and take some contact. He's not a dynamic runner after the catch. He is not. Um, he he has some flaws as a pass catcher. Now, you know, what's not talked about is that ball 
Now, you know, when you track the ball, you want to track it at the earliest point in front of you a lot of times and use overhand attack with 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 certain targets above your head. He likes to have he has this habit where he likes targets that he could do that and then he waits for them to go past his head and try and catch underhand or extend his hands outward underhand rather than extend overhand and in front at the earliest window. The difference with that is is that when you're facing faster, savvier, technically sound, more physical competition, and the ball arrives at the earliest window, you want to get your hands on it because if it bounces off your fingertips, it, those fingertips slow the spin of the ball enough to have a soft bounce, and you might get a second chance at the ball. Or if it goes through your mitts, it bounces off your chest and maybe slower because it went off your fingertips, and you get a second chance at the ball. But if you're waiting to the last possible window to catch the ball and it's high and you have your hands underneath like this or up here, you don't have as much control to pull it down. It may be too low and the defender can get his hands in there. There's a lot more room for error or for the defender to make a play on the ball. And he's dropped passes multiple games because of this. Now, is this going to be the difference between him being an instant starter and a bust? He's not a bust. I don't think he's going to be a bust at all. I think he's one of the three best receivers in this class for sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. And an instant starter. But, you know, so if you want him and you know that your offense is going to be, I can get him to be a blocker. I can get him to be a physical presence on the boundary off play action. We can do some work with, you know, play action, develop, you know, slower developing plays that way and get him open. Um, I think he'll be a good fit. And I think he'll be a good fit for that system. Um, personally, I think Malik Neighbors is by far the best wide receiver in this class. Um, and I think that it's not, I don't even think it's close in, from a scouting standpoint, from maybe a data standpoint, a fantasy football standpoint, you know, what you see on a highlight standpoint, it may look close. But Malik Neighbors, if you're scouting for all the teams, he's the best route runner, he's sudden. He knows how to, he has a, he and Harrison both have good releases. Neighbors breaks are better. They're a little sharper. He's a little more versatile where you can use them all over the field um, in different spots. He wins contested plays. He's skilled with his pacing after the catch. Um, very on point hands technique. Just a lot fewer margins for error with his game. Um, so to me, he's more likely to be an instant starter of extremely high value right away and have a long career as an, an elite wide receiver. Whereas Marvin Harrison, I look at as an instant starter who has a chance to be that a better chance than most, but I think neighbors could make that impact right away. So yeah, that's kind of where I am with those two. I do hear a lot. They're like one a and one B kind of options, but like you mentioned the versatility and actually being that more well-rounded skill set, that does make a lot of sense. And so if we're talking about like day two options, yeah. say like round two or round three, where they can still get that like kind of impact, if not necessarily starter, at least a heavy contributor, who do you think would be some good values? Certainly look, um, you know, probably on those next days, if you're looking for a speedster who might be able to expand his game to a level where as long as his hands are a little more consistent from than what the technique shows, not so much whether he catches a ball, but when you project to the next level, Xavier Worthy is a is a you know that explosive player who can do a lot for your team um, and be a little bit more of a presence um, underneath than maybe what his size looks. Um, I think Lad McConkey certainly in an offense where if you're going to use more slot, you can get that out of him. If you're going to look for more of a classic flanker who could maybe lead your team as a flanker, I think Javon Baker out of um, Central Florida is an exciting player. Um, former Alabama player, very good route, pretty good route runner, actually. It's a very good, very good in a contested element. Um, you know, pretty, pretty good hands, very good after the catch. Um, so he's that type of player that can pose a danger and probably play both positions outside if you really needed him to, and or at least develop in that range. He's probably one of my favorite players. Anaya Smith may not even be in the in the first three rounds. He may go on day three, but I don't know. 
I don't know, but how people look at him. But at Texas A&M, he was regarded as a pretty high-end prospect before the ACL injury, and he is a very good um, pass catcher. I think he's a better route runner than advertised. He was, people thought, is he a running back or a wide receiver? He's a wide receiver who runs the ball extraordinarily well to where, you, you know, so he's a good guy. Brian Thomas, a lot of people are, you know, big fans of, and I see it. I think that he has more close, he's more closer to the AJ Green starter kit, maybe with a part or two missing or ones that are sold separately that you could, <laughs> you could probably get, you know, that you could acquire for him and he might be able to develop into that kind of guy. Um, you know, I like his game. And then two more that I would mention, you know, if you're just looking for, if you're looking for, well, we'll get to late round guys. Jalen Coker's a late round guy, probably, or a mid mm. to late round guy. But I think he's a major sleeper um, who is not far from contributing right away um, in terms of how he attacks the football, um, his size, his contact balance, his his route running's got, got some good work. And Malachi Corley out of um, Western Kentucky. Yeah, King. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, listen, that 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 guy's contact balance. You can see why Steve Smith goes on TV and is gaga about him because he sees a little bit of himself in Malachi Corley. And, uh, and I'm gonna, I love Steve Smith. I mean, for whatever you, you know, for whether you loved him or hate him. Um, I've always loved Steve Smith, and especially as a player, I thought he was one of the greatest wide receivers in the history of the game who doesn't get as much of the credit as he probably deserves. Um, and he was a one-man gang in Carolina. And I look at Carol Corley. He's not quite that, but he is certainly physical. He's a better route runner than you would expect. Um, you know, And if you're looking for some safe guys, certainly you know, Jermaine Burton, Jermaine Burton may never be a wide receiver one, but he's he's very competent, kind of a Robert Woodsy type of player, mm. you, you know, from that end. Brendan Rice, certainly someone who may be a little faster than what than what we realize. Yeah, and, I like and him. So he can be physical. Um, you know, the you know, there's a lot of receivers in that range where if the fit's right, they could uh, progress to being a starter pretty quickly. If the fit's not right. They could wind up in an organization where maybe they don't see the field as much. They don't see as many reps. They don't. They make some mistakes because of that. Now they're downgraded. Coaches get fired. Guys bring in new people. Mm. More good receivers coming in. So it's that. There's a lot in that range for me. Yeah, and the Patriots we do know obviously kind of clear it house very new offensive staff. But one thing we do know is, or at least it sounds like um, this was a strategy that was employed with the Packers is that the young guys will get a chance to play. It's not necessarily the days of old where it's going to take at least a year for some of these guys to ever see the field. So hopefully, if the fit is right, that's the biggest piece that's missing. But if it is, then they'll at least get opportunities to contribute, and then kind of see how that goes. Moving on to more pass catchers, the tight end position. Now, it seems like Brock Bowers is really the only, like, yes, home run first round type prospect in the class. But it does seem like in the middle rounds, that's where you're probably getting the best value. So with, you know, you're thinking rounds one to three, they're probably going to go for the Patriots, more quarterback, receiver, tackle. But if they want to get a weapon, maybe in that kind of second round range, who do you think might be a good value pick? And then moving on, like I said, kind of middle to late rounds, who do you think would be a good value for them? Because it feels like there's a lot of guys where they could get drafted it a little bit later but still have some pretty good careers yeah i would say that the mid-round guy or the early to mid-round guy of this there's two in this group we'll say to choose your flavor if you want the aaron hernandez-esque flavor of the h-back or chris cooley-esque h-back flavor of a player then jatavian sanders you know out of texas he's a good enough blocker in the sense that he can wall off he does take good angles to um, as a lead blocker, as long as it's within the first five yards, like he's good in the first five yards. Um, but anywhere beyond the second level, he's kind of hit or miss. And it's hard for some of those guys, but he can turn some defenders. He can play with some bigger guys, um, but he's, he's fluid as a pass catcher. He, I think that he can give you an outside presence and develop into that in the sense of, you know, people have talked about him as maybe he's, 
you know, the co comparable player that he'd aspire to is David Njoku. And I think that there's some merit to that. There you go. You know, so it's you got fit. the Cleveland Browns connection from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there's something there with that. He's um, So I think that that's not a bad option. Now, if you need more of the 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 physical inline blocker, but also maybe a guy who can catch the ball well, but you're looking for him to – to maybe hang around the first 10 to 15 yards of the line of scrimmage more often than not. And then if he can get yards after the catch, good for you. I would say Ben Sanat, the uh, the Kansas State, who is a fave. Like, just from my sensibility of football, you know, and I'm a Cleveland Browns fan, but like an old school Cleveland Browns fan, I Ben Sanat is a snowplow, okay? The, the dude is literally, he, as an inline blocker, he can move defensive tackles. He can move defensive ends. And I'm talking not like, you know, I'm not talking like Southeast Missouri State, no offense to them, but I'm talking like Texas's dudes, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, he can move right. some of those guys. He can turn them. You can use him on the wing, in line, outside, and maybe he's not great on stock blocking within a certain distance, again, because he's not the fastest dude, but he's quick enough. He can work across the field and cut you. He can stand you up. Um, he can give you all the cutoff blocks, the drive blocks, the the you know the different types of things that you're looking for. And he can like that Harrison the ball. Bryant type kind of. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh no, I would say Harrison's <laughs> no. Like Harrison Bryant on, you know, probably on a on a you know, a Texas barbecue diet, probably. Right, right. You know? <laughs> but and, like in terms maybe, of that scheme use, kind yeah, of like move around, let him do this stuff. Yeah, I would say you could use him that way, but you mm -hmm. might even be able to use him more like maybe a, a Kyle Juszczyk type of player, but maybe not okay. quite as dynamic of a mover, but he can catch. He can, mm -hmm. he, now not only can he, if Kyle's Juszczyk is more agile, but not very powerful, Sano is more like the guy who's going to run through multiple reaches and wraps. And when someone hits him, I described him on X last night at, or Twitter, for those of you who don't keep up with whatever's ever changing there. He's like, a, he when someone hits him, it doesn't look as hard of a hit as it actually is. It's like he's a marshmallow with an iron core. He doesn't look that. like a marshmallow, <laughs> but it's like, but it's like the hit is like it's like hitting a pillow or something, but then the guy just falls down. Um, so it doesn't look as as crazy, but he's good. And then if we went late round or later rounds, like day, you know, day three, Eric All, the former Michigan Iowa tight end, he has an ACL tear right now. He might be one of he might be my second best tight end in this class. If wow. he's and I've got some more tight ends to watch, but um, and I'm doing that this this week. But all is all can catch. He can go up and win the ball. So he can give you some of the dynamic downfield play. But he had to block at Michigan and Iowa, and you can see that he's more H back than than inline guy. He's not necessarily as much Sam Laporta, but he's he's maybe more you know Hunter Henry with a with more um, athletic ability to to mm -hmm. threaten the vertical. Um, so. He, he might be a guy that if they want to wait on and take a chance, he's someone that stood out to me. And Brevin Span Ford out of Minnesota, he's 6'7", 270. Yeah. He's still learning the position, okay? Like, I saw him two years ago, and I was like, this guy, I know he played tight end in high school a little bit, but it looks like he's still figuring out where to block, what to do, what, everything's moving too fast. You know, he could catch but he seemed like a little bit of a wild child in terms of not know everything's moving fast. But the past two years, as I've watched him, it's like, he's figured out how to block in the second half of the season. And it was like the light turned on and he got excited. Like you could tell <laughs> he was like, Oh, this is what it's all about. I can't wait to do this again. Like I can, <laughs> I can actually like dominate some people. Like I know what to do. And That's the awesome. game's like caught up to me. So he still needs some time, but the fact that he's made that effort and you're seeing that progress and he's got that kind of build and body, he's that late round guy or UDFA sign and you take a chance on and go, maybe something could hit. 
I like that. And one, I actually quickly to go back to the receivers. Yeah. We got a question in the comment section. Roman Wilson, he's someone that I know you have tweeted about on X. I saw there was a post kind of about the hips and there was like some wasted movement maybe. So what are your thoughts on Roman Wilson? Yeah, I mean, I think he's a good player and I think he falls in that range of players that the right fit, you know, and, and he's willing to work at the game at the level that he should and not just what everybody says right now. Um, then... Yeah, I think he can be a starter for a team. I don't think he's a number one top five option. I think that people got too excited about the Senior Bowl. And, you know, Jim Nagy does a great job with that event. But, you know, I'm going to take I'm going to I'm going to listen to what he has to say about pl every player, because in the sense of that, he's promoting the game. He's right. promoting people to come and he wants people to get high draft positions. He wants people to, you know, that kind of thing. And I'm not saying that. He wasn't a good scout or anything crazy like that. I'm just saying his role's new now. He's he's also promoter of of his event. So you know, when I look at Roman Wilson and the the buzz that's coming off of that, I'm not you know I think a lot of that is buzz. When I watch his game, you know, catching the ball, he's fine. Um, not extremely powerful player. Um, his route running is decent, but it's not one-on-one -on -one primary receiver worthy at this stage of the game just yet. Um, and then as a route runner, I mean, at, with releases, that's a big part of your game. So when what I was referring to on X is that there are plays where he chooses release maneuvers that don't necessarily fit the coverage he's facing. Like he, it's like he, I was showing a hip shift and the hip shift is where basically you're you're sticking you, you know you you stick and plant your foot in one direction then and, and then right at the next step in the opposite direction and then go back in the original direction and that's something you use against off coverage with a defender directly over the top of you and he was using it against an alabama defender who was playing well inside of him and he was the end of the hip shift was going into where the defender was now i get that but that meant that he was going to have to make that defender believe that he was going outside to an extent that he was going to move all the way across and cut off Wilson in mid route. And nobody's going to do that. You know, that's <laughs> not what that moves for. What he would have been better off doing was maybe using a double up or, um, you know, doing something else with maybe, uh, uh, you know, a double move in essence that may have gotten that and opening up his, his body to the outside to get the defender to do that. Um, and he, so it's like, he doesn't pick the best things for that. So, you know, I look at him overall and it's like in a year or two, I think he can be a high end contributor. Do I necessarily think that he's going to be an instant guy this year? Not without a great fit. Selfishly. Now I'm kind of curious what you think of someone like a Ricky Pearsall. Cause when it comes to those release packages and his work in his STEM, I feel like those are kind of areas where he excels just from what I've seen of him so far. I love Ricky Pearsall and I have him a little bit above Roman Wilson. Um, he's, he's still in that tier of guys that, you know, like Brendan Rice, you know, Jalen McMillan, Jermaine Burton. I think Ricky Pearsall is, so I would love to see Ricky Pearsall reunited with Anthony Richardson, to be honest, um, oh, you, you know, because he does work. They work well together. He has excellent. He also has excellent catch radius in terms of being able to really reach out and and win the ball he makes some tough catches um and he adjusts well i think he's a he's a football the old school scouts say he's a football player which to me means he processes the field fast and processes the game well and can improvise you know and that's you know we go back to that so yeah i like him Awesome. All right. Last position we're going to ask you about running back. Now, again, this is probably not one the Patriots are going to invest in too early. Probably talking more like third round or later. Uh, what do you think about this class? I haven't personally gotten a chance to dig in as much as I would like. So this is going to be kind of new for me. But who are some options you think could fit with this Patriots scheme? It's tough because we don't know exactly what the scheme is going to look like, right? They still have to build out the offensive line. So we know, okay, they're probably going to be more downhill, more side to side. But we do know that in this kind of Cleveland Browns, esque system they're going to want to run the ball so they can set up play 
play action. And with Ramondre Stevenson on the last year of his deal, it's probably likely they're going to want somebody who could be a bell cow. And also, most likely, if they end up double dipping, somebody who might be able to be a pass catching option, because that's something that, you know, Ramondre Stevenson and Ezekiel Elliott, they've done an admirable job, but they're really not the kind of guys that you want having the kind of workload they've had in the receiving game. Yeah, I I love Ramondre Stevenson. I've been a uh, Ramondre Stevenson is a is a fantastic back. I think who who still has more opportunities ahead of him to become a, to deliver strong seasons, and hopefully he'll do that ne- this coming year. Um, and I, I love think your fence rim, by the way. They're fantastic. Yeah, oh, I appreciate that. You know, of course. and and you know, um, certainly you look at this offense, and there's a number of players in this group where. There, there's nobody that you would look at and say, maybe there's one or two players that you'd look at and say, yeah, maybe you'd go early second day for mm-hmm. some of these guys if you really think it's a great fit. But there's a lot more players in this range who you feel like could eventually maybe be a lead back or at least be a committee back of value. And and they're, they're kind of all grouped together that way. Um, the guy that I think would be fun... Um, if injury forces him to be dropped and you're just like, let's give him a year and we're going to take a chance on him earlier than we'd expect, the top back in his class might be Jonathan Brooks out of Texas. And yeah. you might be able to get him at a discount because of the ACL tear. He's kind of got a – if like if you cross Cadillac Williams and Melvin Gordon in terms of the gliding style, really good at being able to make people miss, um, can run tougher than you would expect, um, catches the ball well out of the backfield, excellent pass protector, kind of do it all for you. Jonathan Brooks is that guy at six feet, 207 pounds. Now, if you're looking for someone who catches the ball really well and has just a curious track record for some reason that I will admit we'll probably learn more about than what I know right now, but that's Dylan Johnson out of Washington. I'm a huge Dylan Johnson fan from what I've seen. Mike Leach, you know, rest in peace. He's he's a fantastic um, mind for the game. At the same time, not to, you know, just to point out facts. You know, he's the same guy that, you know, blindfolded Craig James' son and put him in a shed because he didn't think he was tough enough, you you know, back in the day. You can look that up in ESPN. (laughs) You you know, like he was kind of old school about things. And there's a clip and I that they that YouTube has attributed to leach um basically saying that he was glad dylan johnson left mississippi state because he didn't think he was very tough now i don't have that verified whether that's true or not but all i know is when i watch the tape um i watched dylan johnson run through people at all three levels run over them at all three levels um pass block as well as as any i mean if jonathan brooks isn't number one dylan johnson might be as a pass protector, he can catch the ball extraordinarily well. He was more of a receiving back at Mississippi State and Mike Leach's system. Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> you know, he's not extraordinarily fast, but like Ramondre Stevenson, we see you don't need you need to be quick. Right. You need to be able to get into the secondary. You don't have to beat everybody in the secondary. It's like arm strength. It's nice, but yeah. you know, it's not where you're making your money. Yeah. So mm-hmm. he's a guy that's intriguing, and and he also, you know. He injured himself. He played through an a foot injury, a broke. He put, played through a foot injury and an ankle injury, and then re-injured it at the end of the Texas game, this penultimate game of the year, and played through the national championship with a wrap on his knee and ankle, and looked pretty good doing it to me, even though his stat line wasn't fantastic. Mm-hmm. It was because they were behind in game scripts more than anything. He looked good, so he doesn't. I don't know what the toughness element was. But he certainly they, – they say he's an engaging kid. So there's those two guys. You could look at – if you're looking for more receiver who can might surprise you as a runner and give you that um, ability to work as a zone runner who has good size to be that guy, Dylan Lobby out of New Hampshire. I'm a Let's huge go. Dylan Lobby. All right. Guy. I think he's a top five back in this class. Um, and I think he's – you know, I think he definitely deserves that. Blake Corum might be the safest back, um, you know, in terms of just smart decision maker, can run pretty much everything you're looking for. Um, Ray Davis, if you're looking for more of a thumper, he might be interesting from that standpoint. He can catch, but he's not, you know, 
you're, you're, I don't think pass protection is really his thing. So I don't know how they're going to treat that. Trey Benson's up and down for me on certain levels, but like he's exciting because of his speed. Um, and I think that he could give you some real upside there. If you're looking for just late round guys, Blake Watson, who's not invited to the combine, but there were three third down picks, third round picks who didn't get invited to the combine last year, according to Chad Ryder at NFL.com. So it's not like they always get it right. And they're not trying to get it right. They, they're just taking a, they ask the teams, who do you want to see at the combine? And if, you know, seven teams say this and 12 teams say that, then sometimes they got to make some decisions and say, all right, um, we're going to, we're going to go ahead and let this guy go come in, you know, Deshaun Fenwick out of Oregon state, but we're not going to let Blake Watson in who, you know, to me is kind of a Gio Bernard type of player, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think if Gio yeah. Bernard came out when Austin Eckler came out, we might not know the difference as much as we think. Um, mm -hmm. But Gio Bernard was aging and when, and basically playing on a team that still wanted a big back, and you know he didn't get those types of touches but he was you know he and eddie lacy were the top two backs in their class that year easily um and bernard had a long career but lake watson has a little bit of that in his game matt i've taken up so much of your time thank you so much brother this has been a pleasure we're gonna have you back on at some point please let the people know where they can find you and what fantastic work you got coming down the pipeline so we can all watch out for it. Sir, you can you can find me at mattwaldman.com to get the rookie scouting portfolio. It is 150 plus prospects at the four positions we profiled today. I'm in my 19th year doing it. Um, and it's $21.95. You get a pre-draft. And if you're a fantasy um, guy, you get a post-draft. So it's got fantasy football approval, but it's also steeped in real football like i said at the beginning of the show you know it's one of the two most looked at publications for cross-checking purposes by nfl people according to like recruiting directors like smu's alex brown um and you can find my youtube channel matt waldman's rsp film room where i do podcasts but also do video breakdowns i have a long one with you all know mark schofield and oh, yeah. mark and i used to do a podcast together every week um, Mark and I break down Caleb Williams on that show. We'll probably be doing another one down the line and spend an hour doing that. We'll probably spend more doing other, some of the other quarterbacks during draft season as we can. Um, you can find me at football guys. If you're a fantasy football person, cause I've been doing, I've been writing about fantasy football since 2003. Um, and I'm a senior staff writer there and at, on X at Matt Waldman, W A L D M A N. You can find me and I'm always just putting up stuff and it's usually not clickbait it's usually just film-based stuff and an occasional stuff about my dog who thinks he's a free safety for the cleveland browns <laughs> for my money matt best eye for detail in the game thank you so much for stopping by and thank you all for stopping by as always appreciate you very much now take care of yourselves take care of